Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to today's session. Um, so, yeah, I, there was a slide just before. So if you wanted to um, just let us know what land you're joining us from, that would be great. Um, and, yeah, as we start, um, I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Kulin Nation on whose lands we're living, working and creating on. Um, I'd like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and, and extend that respect to any First Nations people who are viewing this session today. Um, my name is Gabriella or Gabby and um, I'm talking to you from the land of the Boon Wurrung and Woi Wurrung Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, and I'd like to acknowledge that sovereignty was never seen. Um, so this session explores self-determination and collective reclamation through the arts and um, talking about self-determination and collective reclamation. Um, this week is NAIDOC week, in case you didn't know, um, and NAIDOC week celebrates the history, culture and achievements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So um, yeah, please check out what's happening. Um, I'll put the link to NAIDOC week in the chat. Um, and so, yeah, to give you some context, so um, this is, we're talking about um, ArtsGen as a case study today. Um, and I'll introduce everyone very soon, but um, let me just put the link to NADOC quick in the chat. Cool. Um, so, uh, Cohealth Arts Generator is based at Footscray Community Arts Centre in Melbourne's Inner West. And um, it's a creative incubator, learning site and vocational hub with programs that prioritize communities from Melbourne's west and north. Um, using socially engaged creative arts practices, initiatives strive to build voice, develop agency, increase social connectedness, reduce ethnic and race-based discrimination and increase access to economic resources through learning and development. Um, and today I'm joined by um, some awesome people um, who will be talking um, today and I'm going to introduce them. So uh, we have um, Geskiva Komba. Geskiva Komba is a transdisciplinary creative producer and performer of Comorian and Tanzanian heritage. Raised in the western suburbs of, suburbs of Melbourne, she has 14 years experience combined in community development, theatre, spoken word and music. Geskiva went through Cine Space to expand her producing and story, storytelling skills in film and television. She is also an alumni of the 321 workshop at Compton School taught by Andrea Buck and David Kaur to develop her skills in business sustainability within the creative industries. Geskiva is currently studying at the VCA doing the Master of Producing and is passionate about combining her skills working with community, the performing arts and writing stories that build platforms of multiplicity and authentic representation. Um, Maz will be talking about um, working with communities and what representation means in the context of institutions. Uh, and we also have Phil or Philip Michael Pandongan. Um, and he is also known by his stage name, Young Philly, um, and he's a performer and facilitator. His performing form is rapping and emceeing. He began rapping professionally in 2004 and grew into emceeing or hosting in 2007. The skill of facilitation began circa 2010 as an intrinsic part of rapping workshops. Phil has conducted for mostly young people more Moreover, within a co-health co arts generator project, Sisters and Brothers. Uh, Phil will be talking about one's agency as community slash artist slash facilitator slash employee, um, as well as pathways. And lastly, we have um, Ruth Nyadiwat Roch. Um, she is a South Sudanese cultural curator, multidisciplinary artist who uses art to heal, explore her surroundings and create comfort within a blackness. Ruth's art explores the experiences of being an African of the diaspora, although she is strongly influenced by decolonizing language, tone, and the cultivation of shared perspectives in place of assimilation. Uh, and Ruth will be talking about um, sustainability of activism and communities of solidarity. So um, we, we're all connected to ArtsGen in some way. Um, most of us have um, worked at ArtsGen as employees, but we've also been um, 
artist facilitators in different programs. And so today um, you'll hear from everybody. We, we kind of decided to have this more of a, in the spirit of Arts Gen as a free flowing kind of, um, or almost a conversation, but um, we're gonna start with Phil. Um, he's gonna kick us off and then um, each person will, yeah, will come in and, and contribute to the discussion. Um, and then afterwards we'll open it up to um, all the attendees for any, any questions. Um, so having said that, um, Phil, are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Awesome. <laughs> I'll hand over to you. Thank then. you. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wudda Wurrung people and acknowledge uh, and extend my respects to Elders past, present and future and uh, also celebrating um, people of First Nations in this uh, NADOC week. Um, I just want to shout out to um, the ICCP event organizing committee, uh, the tech support that are currently here, um, and uh, a few members that I've been in association with in the CoHealth Arch Generator space. Uh, so shout outs to Rama and Chris Sun. Um, and a couple of peeps that are in the space um, listening, um, Mary and Liz, hello, and those that I can see in my in my screen, Natalie, Amy, hello, how are you? Um, let's click on the arrow. Hello, Jane, Annie. Wow, there's a few more here. Uh, and, and it looks like a few members, according to the dialogue name, it's Eco Sir, so, and Alison as well. Cool, I think I've <clears throat> said everyone. Um, so yeah, my particular talk is about one's agency um, in community as an artist, as an artist facilitator uh, and employee. And um, I hope to illustrate this through um, my personal journey through um, through community arts and also community um, co-health arts generator. Um, and hope that through these particular stages in my career um, that you may be able to understand how the agency is developed. Um, and, and this is an artist facilitator perspective. Um, and here I go. So I think let's rewind back to approximately, um, yeah, 2010, um, where the Barclay Arts Center, which was the previous name of CoHealth Arts Generator, had made a call out to MCs, singers, beatboxers, et cetera, young people between the age of 18 to 25, uh, to come together at this spot, which was at Barclay uh, Street Footscray. And um, my memory, of the actual people that that came were people that I I knew and um, people that I didn't and so with the people that I knew they may have participated in their particular art form such as beatbox as a hobby myself I was a I was already part of uh, a community health project uh, called Group 120 that was um, in association with Duda Gala which happens to be associated with CoHealth as uh, it is now an amalgamation of, of a few different health orgs that happened several years ago. Um, that's when I believe the next stage, which I'll categorize as um, development, uh, comes through. And when I mean development, uh, development as an artist, through rehearsal, um, collaborative songwriting, uh, professional development, uh, affectionately known as PDs, <laughs> um, meetings, performances, and recordings. Um, so this particular phase was a very dense period of between, I would say, 2011, 2013. Um, and out came the massive hip hop choir, which you may have heard in some of the bios. So that was the name of the collective. And we were about, <laughs> initially we were about 22 people in the room. And um, I guess as weeks progress in programs of this nature, the ones who stick around become the core group. And um, yeah, and, and, and hence 
uh, these particular activities continue. We met weekly, um, Thursdays between four and six. Um, and I'm just going off, off the top here, you know, recordings, we made recordings for album, for an album, uh, a massive album. Um, meetings were discussed to go through particular performances that were happening. Um, the collaborative songwriting happened within rehearsal. And, and so even within those rehearsals, we had artist facilitators who were already established um, in their own right as personal artists and in the community arts. Um, and then we go through to, um, I guess, 2013 to 2020, um, and that's mentoring through workshops. Um, now, eventually, uh, the Massive Hip Hop Choir reached a point where the question was, where to now? Um, and incidentally, I guess that eludes a sense of agency as a collective moving on its own after a few years of support. Um, but more directly to this particular presentation, a few members of the Massive Hip Hop Choir continued uh, into uh, work, continued work with Barclay Arts Centre. And I think around that time it became CoHealth Arch Generator. And um, one of the biggest um, programs that helped my development in mentoring and artist facilitation was the Sisters and Brothers program. The Sisters and Brothers program, um, <clears throat> and, and Gabby, please do this if I keep, you know, um, one thing that I remember at one point in my life, probably maybe 2015 or 2016. So the Sisters and Brothers program had, had started in 2013 and I was a part of that in its um, creative content, um, training and meetings in developing the, the eight week program uh, that goes out to schools to talk about race-based discrimination in a creative way. Um, three years on, I thought, I, I looked at Sisters and Brothers in a different way because previously I was still developing as an artist. I was very rap centric. And then at about that time in 2016, I realized that the consistency of the program, because it kept on running, made me realize that there was a sense of security there that I felt. And I, I think it affected the way that I actually looked at the program, um, kind of inverse where I started to look more into race-based discrimination and what it means to me and the actual rap skill that I brought to it kind of came secondary. I, I think I already knew that I could bring that. Now it was a higher awareness of exactly why we're covering race-based discrimination. Um, and so in that period, and it's ongoing, that's another stage of one's developing agency through an artist facilitator's perspective. Um, come 2017, um, I guess being part of the Sisters and Brothers program for four years at that point and continuing, um, the, the um, coordinator of the program had um, stepped away from the role. And I, I, I guess, um, Within, within the staff at CoHealth Arts Generator. Meanwhile, I was not employed. I was still an artist facilitator. Um, so, someone um, was required to continue the program because at that point, which was about 2017, we were working actively at primary schools. Um, I, I, was, I was nominated to be the program coordinator and um, yeah, um, sit in the CoHealth Arts Generator space as a community and cultural development officer. And I've been there since. Um, uh, one thing I'd like to point out is, yes, the role for the initial few years was to coordinate the Sisters and Brothers program. And then I uh, acquired um, another project called Benchmark, which is essentially a, 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 an accessible music program um, for, for young people in Melbourne's uh, West. Um, and I think one, one particular point that I think 
is different from previous years through my involvement in Co-Health Arts Generator slash Buckley Arts Center is that I now understood what networking is. Previously, I would perform and there would be the, you know, um, I guess the interlude where, where people can mix and mingle, have some something to eat and the event would, would conclude. And, and it was at that particular point where, you know, after a performance, you eat, you, you just take a take relaxation. And I knew people were talking. I knew people were, you know, saying hello to each other, probably knew each other from um, their respective projects, but I didn't understand it then. But now I understand that the, um, the ability to have networks that um, I guess coincide with the project objective is helpful because you get the project name out there, the objective, you may be able to gain interest from young people. So I think that's one thing that I developed uh, a new interest and, and outlook for. Um, one example in the benchmark program was getting in touch with the youth support and advocacy services, um, who coincidentally, I, I knew a few people who, who, who worked there. And so it was a bit of an easier process than usual and probably preferred because um, at, at least there's a particular sense of um, uh, authenticity in talking about a partnership from the ground. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here and, and just talk uh, about the agency aspect um, in reflection. So now at this point uh, and, and through my artistic working years, working with Co-Health Arts Generator, I experienced and developed agency as, as, a, as a performer and gained insight um, as to the agency of an individual slash employer, employee through performance and collective conversation. Um, and some examples of that include from a performer perspective in 2020, being 34, I know what burning out as a performer is. And so I'm able to manage the, um, <laughs> the amount of gigs that I say yes to, because at that point, any gig was a good gig. Um, but now I'm able to have the agency to make a change to my lifestyle and not do multiple gigs on the one day. Um, now, when someone is offering an event um, to us through Co-Health Arts Generator, I look at the nature of the gig. I look at the nature of the gig because um, it's, it's okay, it's one thing to say yes because it's a performance, but um, with a more critical lens, it's probably more important to um, think of the people that you are considering even being a part of this. And, and that's primarily the young people. Um, and more into the um, agency as an individual slash employee through performance and collective conversation, both SMBs, <clears throat> being about race-based discrimination and another project in the art of radical listening um those two projects um those two projects so smbs being grounded in race-based discrimination and the art of radical listening um you know with the underscore of the 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 decolonizing um ambition compelled me to research and develop critical thinking, race literacy, philosophy, and Filipino history. Um, so I believe that there's degrees of agency across a few things that I mentioned, one being uh, as an artist facilitator and as an individual. Thank you. Thanks, Philly. <laughs> um, and uh, you've covered quite a bit there. And, um, I guess I, I also just wanted to add, like, you know, um, that, that it's great to hear about your own experience as a as an artist and um, the things that you've developed along the way. And and I know, like, with the benchmark program as well, it's um, the benchmark program is just a, it is a music program, a youth music program. And I, I've seen, you know, young people um, who are in their early 20s sort of grow from being a participant to then um, being a facilitator or like a training facilitator and then moving on to being um, a, a core facilitator. And that's kind of also 
part of I think I see like as the pathways um so upskilling um mm. yeah I think that's just the the development of people that you see um in programs is really awesome um so thanks philly um maybe you should decide who who talks next <laughs> so um, yeah yeah no doubt um <clears throat> maz would you like to take the mic so bit <laughs> hi everyone um i go by the name is maz um or Gaskeva. And I am also uh, part of the Art Student family. I've got a background in theatre and music. And um, like Gabby had said, I've got 14 years um, in experience in community development. Uh, speaking on um, the statements that we should be responding to, I am responding to working with communities and what representation means in the context of institution. Um, for myself, I first want to acknowledge that anyone who is here that is white and that is a, in a position of power, uh, you need to understand that speaking up about these topics isn't easy for black people, indigenous or people of color to do because um, we have to sit with the off chance that we will likely be silenced, um, which enables structural and symbolic violence to be patch, per, uh, perpetrated for expressing and exposing like our traumatic experiences that may very well happen within the very institutions you work for. So for myself, I urge you to think about the people that you work with, whether uh, in the past or present or, um, and make a conscious decision to actively listen and sit with your, any, any discomfort or resol unresolved tension you feel in your mind or Body, if you come across situations like these and not shift that feeling by projecting it back to the individuals or people you should be supporting in your workplace. Also, I hope that this conversation urges you to take a hard look um, at the people you work with and if they truly represent the people and communities you serve and claim to want to support. So the statement working with communities and what representation means in the context of institution. I didn't really base it on maybe in my experiences because again, going back to, you know, re-traumatizing and triggering myself, I didn't want to do that. So I just wrote down what I was feeling, what I was thinking, and i um, just gonna read that out to you. Um, so for myself, there are two parts to that statement. One is working with communities and filtering through what that looks like. And then the second part is what representation means in the context of institutions. However, I do see the overlapping tensions and connections between the two. And for the first part, I would say that it's really important that we allow communities to work in a way where they can exercise their self-determination and when I say self-determination, I mean allowing communities or individuals to, to decide how they need support. It's not about leaving them high and dry to do their own thing, but being a peripheral system of people of support for when and how they need it. Self-determination does not mean I don't need your help. It does not mean I can do this on my own. It just means I want to do this my way, but I can do it alone but I can't do it alone and I might not know the right answers or know the right decisions to make, but your advice and guidance as an institution, person of privilege, person with access and networks would be greatly appreciated. And we might, we might not take it, but that comes with communities or individuals wanting to exercise their self-determination. The second part to that statement, I would respond by saying that representation and its meaning in the context of institutions is barely, if not non-existent for me and based on my experiences, particularly in bureaucratic institutions, such as councils, community health services, universities. And if it is, if it is there, only, uh, it's only there at the grassroots level. Um, representation uh, from my experience, once again, is poorly handled um, in many institutions. Uh, I feel that representation in an institution can only exist if those working within and in positions of power decide to dismantle. Um, and it's not about changing or creating strategic plans for the next four years of trans transitions. It's definitely about dismantling the current structures and policies and procedures in place. 
and rebuilding it to have authentic and a multiplicity of authentic representation. And that's not having one or two of your like tokenized Asian, Black, African or First Nation staff colleagues who sit next to you in your office. That isn't representation. Where the two parts of the statement meet regarding working with communities and what representation could look like for me doesn't really mean anything in the context of institutions. I think that there is still a lot of work to be done. Uh, institutions and those enabling institutions to stand as they are need to do more work, particularly in Australia. We are so fine but behind that I think that it's a bit ridiculous and embarrassing. I think that we seem to always have these conversations with communities or individuals from underrepresented communities, but the affirmative action and change is non-existent or really small where they tokenize and silo jobs, projects and people to tick the box off their checklist. I'm not interested in any chum change or breadcrumbs and I know most people aren't either. So for myself, representation means a lot, particularly if I'm working in an organisation. I need to feel empowered. I need to feel like I can use my own initiative and autonomy. And I need to be seen and see others who look like me. I need to feel like I'm not being gaslit and I need to be heard not just through acknowledge it, acknowledgement, but through action. And when I speak up about issues that I see with the double lens that I have, which I know some people don't have, particularly white people, Showing a bit of intellectual humility is not too much to ask for if you don't know what to say or do. I think that, I think that is when I will begin to feel some sense of cultural safety in such a setting. Representation needs to mean more than just working with communities on a project to project basis because it will get an institution or organization more funding. I think that it, there needs to be more long-term commitments, recruitment and policy changes to allow equitable access for people to manoeuvre properly within an organisation. Um, and I guess with saying all of that, like I do feel that, you know, change is happening, but it's, it, it's a small sense of hope for me. I think being in the various, uh, institutions, uh, organisations that I've worked for in the past, it's, you get really, really tired. The, the emotional labour alongside the general workload that you have is something that I would wish upon anyone. And I, um, I hope that like, you know, Ruth and Phil can share their thoughts on this as well, because I don't want to just take the spotlight on this. And again, it speaks to the idea of representation. That I'm not someone who represents my community. I, um, I'm not a spokesperson, so I'd like them to speak on it as well. Thanks, Maris. Thanks for sharing that. And um, I just <coughs> to yeah, allow Phil and, and Ruth a chance to yeah, add anything to that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I share the same general sentiment with Maz. Um, I, I think about it uh, in and out of work. Um, and I do believe the same in um, the idea of people from um, different backgrounds to be able to manoeuvre um, throughout the chain uh, of an institution. Um, I also analyze what brought the structure that it is now. Um, in my head, sometimes I, I, I obviously don't have the answer, of course, but so just to generally speak with regards to what Maz is talking about um, in a more direct context to um, something that I guess started to appear maybe four or five years ago was that there seems to be a concession granted for people from a different background as if there was an opportunity given that should always be there but because of historical things um, we 
we start from the ground up in this in this sense um that 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 area the grassroots where that hope appears where maz is is directing to where there's that little bit of change um and i feel like i can speak on that because i feel like i'm a peer of maz and therefore can see and understand her um deeply but i'm also wary of time yeah thanks phil i might allow ruth hasn't spoken yet so maybe we can just yeah um yeah give ruth some some time um, and space yeah. <laughs> thank Hi, you ruth. phil <laughs> And Maz, um, my name is Ruth Nyarodraj. Um, I would like to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on, um, the Wanjuri and the Bonarong people. I would also like to show my solidarity to the Japaran um, community and the Japaran people, um, what they're going through currently. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about sustainability of activism and communities of solidarity and when I was um, asked to speak on this um, topic, I was thinking about what it means, um, what sustainability of activism means. And when I was um, brainstorming this, I had to step back and ask myself, I need to decolonize the idea of activism and I need to unlearn the idea of activism because I think that this year has been a very heavy pungent year where globally communities were called out um, not called out in a bad way, but there was a call of action for communities to come together in solidarity. And we saw a huge protest with the Black Lives Matter. Um, we saw the protests here in Australia um, in terms of, you know, um, Indigenous people, Black people, immigrants, um, asylum seekers being mistreated during the pandemic. Um, and... Um, I think that for me, when I think about sustainability of activism, I have to look at um, my mental health, my emotional health, and my capacity as an individual. Um, and I say this because we live in a burnout culture where when one thing uprolls, we actively go on our social medias, post, share, have conversations, share opinions, but then we see a timeline where it dies off. And that doesn't become sustainable anymore because that issue becomes a trend. And I saw this in the Black Lives Matter um, movement and protests where I saw colleagues, um, non-people of color, standing in solidarity with people of color, um, black people, um, indigenous people. But then that was it wasn't there was no follow up to that. So how do we create sustainability in the activist in, the, in activism that we do as individuals? And what do we need to do that allows the um, the energy and the activation to continue. So it's not a one-off thing where I donate to this GoFundMe and that's it, I've done my part. Because at the end of the day, indigenous people, black people, people of color will still continue experiencing institu institutionalized racism, any form of racism, discrimination, dehumanization, that chain of, um, of I, I guess that change of experience will still go on and I always say to people, non-people of color, in order for us to create some sort of sustainability, we need to look at ourselves as individual. We need to look at why we need to, why we came and responded to these call of actions. And a lot of the times, um, and going back to what Maz was saying, um, prioritizing your mental health, not being a spokesperson for communities, um, a lot of the times people don't educate themselves and understand exactly what they're supporting, exactly what they're coming forward for, exactly what certain movements or certain protesting mean. They obviously, because it's a collective thing that happens where everybody is on board and you feel as though if I am not on board, people are going to look at me as a racist or people are going to look at me as somebody that doesn't support these um, communities that are experiencing dehumanization or racism. And I think that that becomes a selfish um, a way of activism where you are centralizing your emotions, centralizing your privilege, centralizing yourself and making it about you contributing to something that creates change. And I think that um, this is something I'm calling myself at also too. And the way I have learned it, I learned and decolonized my way of thinking of activism and lo looking at maintaining resilience and maintaining resistance. 
and how I can create tangible and more creative ways to approach activism. Because if I approach it in a very politicized way, I know the institutions that I need to go through or I need to have conversation in order for certain change to happen. And I don't have the emotional capacity to be having conversations with people who do not understand or identify the things that are happening within our communities. Um, so for, as an individual and for myself, education is a huge um, part of it is, you know, researching, having conversations, but not bombarding that one black friend that you have in terms of understanding black issues. We have the internet. You know, we have this global phenomenon that has connected us on a global scale um, where we can actually understand how Indigenous people, how Black people, how people in the queer community, how people with disability feel when it comes to I injustice. Um, and so I guess it's a broader conversation about unlearning activism, but I think that we need to really redefine what it means to us in, in, a in, a, in a community scale where we're not just giving one grant to a community and saying that we've done our part, but how do we create an ecosystem for communities um, to create something for themselves instead of a union or an organization or institutions that are filled with non-people of color, creating a template and giving it to people of color and saying that work with it. Um, I think I'm tired. <laughs> I want to reclaim my time. I want to reclaim my emotional capacity and my emotional health. Um, so I'm no longer entertaining that type of energy. But what I'm doing is that how can I as an individual, you know, mentor young people, mentor people in our community to really understand, um, you know, um, skills or knowledge to really expand this ecosystem that we as people of color, indigenous people are trying to create to better create that systemic sustainability within our community. And um, going to the other part of community of solidarity, I think that this year, um, and I'm saying not just this year, but many also years past, we've seen um, communities, um, whether it's um, you know, non-people of color or people of color come together and really create this uproar and say that Injustice has been there from the start, you know, and it will still be there until we have dismantled the system and we have taken these people out of position where they are creating power. But, you know, one of the biggest um, acts of solidarity that I saw here in, um, in, um, in Nam is a Japan um, country where people have been protesting since 2018, um, not to, you know, um, to go against what the government has, um, I guess, decided um, to do by destructing and um, demolishing sacred land. And the fact that people came together and, you know, donated food, donated money, went on the campsite and camped there while being, you know, um, I guess, you know, attacked and bullied by, you know, police presence or government presence. And the fact that that protest has, you know, has lingered still now and also seeing the, um, the, the solidarity that happened within the communities when the housing commissions were under lockdown and the heavy police um, presence that were there and the fact that young people came together um, and created this ecosystem of networks to get people to come together, to get people to build something, to prioritize the health and the, the mental health of people in the housing um, um, commissions during that lockdown. Um, and also seeing and, um, SARS in Nigeria right now, how globally people have come together in solidarity to really amplify what's happening in Nigeria, not just in Nigeria, but in Congo, all around the world globally. I think that for me as a person of color, solidarity is, um, I think it's a, it's a third nature for me, um, being as a, a disadvantaged person, is something that I do unconsciously and consciously without the intention of making myself look good, but making sure that people in communities feel safe. And I see that a lot of the times, um, a lot of people do it in a way to gain some sort of, I wouldn't say clap, but some sort of recognition to say that I've helped these type of communities. And I think that that's a very poisonous way to really approach solidarity where you are doing it in gain to say that, oh, I have black people and I have black friends and I've helped them out. No, <laughs> there's a lot of us. You can't just help one. 
and think that you help everybody else. And this is something I say all the time in my social media platforms is that if you're a non-person of color and you are supporting communities of color, you have to really understand your unconscious biasness that responds to that, um, to that call of action and to say, and to see how can I create this sustainability in terms of activism and in terms of solidarity and ways that I tell people is showing up for communities, you know, um, speaking for communities and providing voices and actions um, that are impacting vulnerable communities, um, using your social media platform, not just posting once, but consistently teaching your family and friends about the things that are globally affecting indigenous and black people, people of color, people from the queer com community, people with disability, anybody that is a disadvantage, supporting people financially and sharing their businesses. That's a way to sustainably, um, you know, create that type of solidarity. Um, and also one big thing that I learned about, you know, creating solidarity within the community is creating access. You know, accessibility is a huge thing that people don't really um, think about, but it's such a very new, um, huge thing that, um, that I see that um, is not really, I guess, um, amplified in spaces in terms of, you know, making sure that spaces are, you know, are um, making sure that if you have people with disabilities making that space, you know, accessible with people with disability, making sure that that accessibility is not just a, a physical space, but through language too, you know, not a lot of people, you know, speak English or understand English the, the way we do. So creating that sustain, um, sustain, creating that accessibility in terms of allowing different voices and different sounds to exist in that space and also diversifying the space, um, inviting people that you don't know, inviting people that have a network to come into spaces like this, to have conversations like this. Um, and also networking, making sure that you're not just nominating one person and tokenizing one person, but expanding your networks and, you know, finding people who are the grassroots, creating these changes in their community. And I think that moving forward, um, I mean, there are many other practices that we can, you know, um, activate in order for us to really create the sustainability through activism and through building solidarities with communities. But I think that a lot of it is just like, how do we maintain resilience? How do we not burn out? How do we prioritize our mental health? And how do we create something that, you know, it's, it becomes a domino effect where we're passing on. If we burn out, who do we need to contact? What networks do we have to facilitate that space and to speak about that space instead of us, you know, you know doing the work and actually running on 5% and being like, why am I, you know, crushing or why am I going through this? So, um, yeah, um, I was asked, I was going to answer what Matt said before um, and Phil answered this. Um, I honestly agree 100%. I'm not a spokesperson to any community besides the community of Ruth Nyararach. Um, <laughs> but I will always stand for communities that are, you know, um, are disadvantaged, communities that are constantly dehumanized you know, but, you know, I have a capacity as a human being. Um, and, you know, I hear this a lot of the times is like, as, as black women, as black people, our lives is already politicized, you know, and it's so hard for us to step out of that space and to, you know, and to see how we can create this change outside of politics, but in, in creative um, practices, in creative outlooks. And I think that that's how I contribute in this sustainability of activism, you know, through the artwork, uh, through the work that I do, you know, using art as a vehicle of change, um, working with communities, um, you know, to create some sort of, um, you know, landscape where we're using art to really decolonize ourselves and to really understand who we are and to create, you know, a better ecosystem for the communities that we're from. Um, <laughs> I feel like I've been talking a lot, so. Um, <laughs> I think that's all I had to say. <laughs> Thanks, Ruth. That was amazing. And I just want to acknowledge, like, what a privilege it is to hear all of your perspectives in this space, and and I think for everyone else to hear these perspectives as well, um, because it's not every day you can just actually you know, hear and listen to such like you know it, it's all um, 
really uh, the access to this, you know, kind of these perspectives and information is just really um, something that needs to be shared more widely and understood more widely. Um, so thank you to every one of you. Um, and uh, at this point, yeah, it's open to questions um, from all of you, all of the people here who have been listening, um, some who we know, some who we don't know, um, but you can either um, ask the question in chat or you can just come off mute because I think, yeah, there's not, you know, it's not like a super large group. So you can just probably um, come off mute if you're comfortable with that. Um, so does anybody have any questions? No. I have a question for everybody and I guess people, anybody can answer this. Um, I guess it's just like, what are your self-care practices, I guess, um, you know, after going to a protest or after consuming such very intense, you know, information. So I, just for research. <laughs> Natalie, did you want to answer that? No, that, that, I, I wanted to say um, congratulations to everyone on the panel and thank you. That was fascinating. And I had actually had the exact same question, Ruth, um, around self-care. Um, how do people manage self-care and as community? And I, I should um, say that I am non-white, but I have white passing privilege as well. So I, I occupy a different um, space. And I think that's an, a space that's really important for me to acknowledge, um, though I am certainly in the minority as a woman of colour within the institution that I work. Um, but I'm, I'm very curious, you know, how do people manage self-care and how can communities facilitate the self-care of people who are activists within that community? So I guess how can you manage your self-care as a, a community as well? Uh, I, I, I would say that we're uh, all still learning how to do that you know you take each day as they come but also mm -hmm. ensuring that you have uh, resources whether it's funds whether it's spaces whether it's you know um, you know going out to places or whatever it is for respite, you know, making sure that you're, you practice joy and celebrating yourselves and the people that you're around. Um, and always practicing and uh, cultivating that connection that you have to those people that you're working around and working with. I think that's really, really important for myself. That's my family. That's my Aunt Jen family. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, like making sure that you have those times where you can just be, you know, you don't have to think and perform as we always do. Um, and so that, that, that's my, my way of self-care. You know, it doesn't always work sometimes, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Maz. And I just like listening to um, Ruth before it, it's just, you know, I, I see that a lot of um, the activism, especially in times of like the crisis, like um, it's very much heavily on, you know, s certain um, people in the community or, or at, you know, when it was like the, um, the housing estates, the young people, and it just felt like, maybe there needs to be um, some sort of structure um, outside of those communities, supporting those communities, whether it, it is through resources or just things where, you know, if there's things that um, other people can do to support the work that they're doing directly with communities, like that needs to be ongoing maybe. Um, I don't know, but um, like, I'm just thinking about ways, if there are ways to, um, I guess it's about sharing, like, because everybody really um, can do something um, to actually support and to, to make, to, to bring everybody forward and to, to, um, to do the work. Um, I don't think it should just be on certain 
communities or certain groups in the community. It's um it's an everybody. It needs everybody to actually um, change um, change the the current situation. So um, and the situation that's been ongoing for so many centuries. So um, sorry, Rachel. Um, okay, I just want to yeah. So. Um, there is some work on the ways in which self-care has been co-opted by neoliberal ideas so that self-care becomes individualized, colouring in baths and falls on the individual responsibility. So decolonizing self-care in ways that creates collectivized self-care, for example. I would be really interested in what you think about that self-care. Um, thanks, Rachel. And uh, does anyone want to respond to that? Um, ways to create collective self-care? I think self-care is individualized and can uh, be like there's two parts to it there's individual self-care and there's collective self-care and how you do that is going to be very very different yeah you know, and how you feel things and move through you know day-to-day -day, um, life situations and the things that are impacting how you maneuver and uh, move around institutions um, and you know the the activism that you are probably you know um, uh, you know de demonstrating is is for yourself you can always get support from other um, people, services and things like that, but really about how you can look after yourself and what allows you to, you know, let go of the burden that you're carrying for yourself. Um, and then there's collective care, you know, which is really important to look at too and how, you know, you connect with people and how you can continue to go on a journey with the people that you're working with in a way that you're not uh, toxicizing your spaces uh, by projecting any, you know, things or any feelings or thoughts that you're carrying around that you haven't resolved yet, you know, and really just paying respect to that, paying respect to the people in the space and really holding space for each other um, it, it is important. And what that looks like is determined by the collective, you know. Uh, I, I can't determine that for any collective. I, I, I wouldn't make any suggestions on what that could look like, but you know, I think that any um, any group or any movement or any collective can decide what that looks like, uh, and, and that is um, something for themselves. Mm. Thanks, Mads. Um, so Mary, Mary said, how organisations define care for employees is different from how they might define it for contractors to access can be facilitated by an ally, ally which is unsustainable. Do you mean that access is unsustainable or the, um, sorry. Well, if it's not a, a systems change, then it's unsustainable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, and I think, yeah, like uh, individual and collective care, I see them as um, intertwined. You know, like um, the more people in, in communities um, practice um, individual self-care, the stronger the collective will be. I, well, in my head, that's how it works. <laughs> like you, you kind of, as an individual, contribute what you can to, the, to your community and um, the more sort of um, cared for you are or the more kind of um, you look after yourself, the more you can give as well. And also vice versa, you might get self-care from your community as well. Um, that one stronger. Um, so it is 12.50 or now 12.56. Are we um, over time now, I guess? Um, did you, did anyone want to? <laughs> oh, um, Phil, did you want to add any, any, anything to mm. the discussion? Um, well, that question by Rachel Fox, and thank you, Rachel Fox. I'm putting on my radio community announcement voice because I used to rock on 3CR. Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, I, I start to think about um, men of maybe similar um, background, irrespective of cultural background. I, I, I'm speaking about particular things that have happened in their lives that maybe 
similar to mine that would probably relate to something like a collective care but um that's they're just thoughts that that pass through my head at times you know how that might look in a practical sense um it's not decolonized um as such but it's what that question evoked in me um now that i'm starting to narrow my relationship to a community that's all i really want to add to there all right thanks phil um and thanks to everybody for joining us today and um to ruth um maz and phil um for your yeah amazing contributions and and also like just the knowledge and the experience that you you all have and have shared um and oh yeah bye Brimbank neighborhood house liz um so yeah thanks for thanks for being here and um i hope you enjoy the rest of the um the conference i've been to a few sessions and it's been really interesting um and yeah i um if you have any sentence or word that you've taken away from from today that you leave with uh, maybe you can share it in the um in the chat as well any reflections um, also a little chat on the main conference platform for um, this talk so this talk will get recorded or is being recorded is going to go and there's a little discussion forum there as well on that page so anyone that's watching the recording or as you said has comments you could make them there too oh, okay cool thanks rachel um yeah thanks everybody and um we'll take care for the rest of the year and um yeah thanks for joining <laughs>